Welcome to Masters of Self University Podcast, your highest source of sacred truths and universal wisdom. Hello, beautiful souls. I'm Rachel Fiore, mystic, spiritual teacher, psychic healer, and founder of Masters of Self University. Join our journey of soul transformation as we deep dive into this latest episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Masters of Self University podcast. I'm your host, Ellie Lee. And I'm your host, Donnie Molly. And today we are joined by MSU certified mystical life coach, Emily Armstrong. Woo, woo. Yay. Woo, woo, woo. Hi. <laughs> uh, Emily, welcome back to the show. Uh, let's dive right in. The topic you wanted to discuss today is the path to belonging. So let's get into it. Yeah, thank you. Um, So the path to belonging, the reason I wanted to talk to this one is because it's been a big part of my healing journey. I've had some significant um, steps within healing this one. And um, I think it's something that a lot of people can identify with. Now, I think it's not an uncommon program um, or wound to feel that you don't belong. Um, especially I identify as someone that's highly sensitive. So I have that additional um, thing to consider. Uh, and that definitely added to some of my lack of belonging. But it's an interesting journey. I've got like lots of layers. So I'll kind of, if if that's okay with you guys, I'll dive into some of the, dive away. Um, the kind of four things, the steps. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um. So it started really early on in my healing journey. So I'd started working with Rachel and, um, you know, I think you're (laughs) the same as for most coaches, like you open a box and you're like, whoa, there's just so much there. And, but one of the real standout wounds for me was this very, um, evident thread around not feeling like I fitted in, not feeling like I belonged anywhere. Um, not particularly feeling like I um, could be myself and there was no authenticity. I didn't really know who I was at all. Um, So there was very much a hiding going on and it was almost hiding the wound, if you like. So I started uncovering certain bits and the very first thing I started to come across was this, um, this word. So Rachel really focuses in, as you guys well know, on specific language, the words that we use. She speaks to coding in our language. We give ourselves away in the law of the things that we say. And um, my word that was coming through, which needed some picking apart, was undesirable. And I realized it was it was nothing remotely sexual. It was literally, because that's often what we, we associate with desirability, but it was literally to do with the fact that I didn't feel wanted that my personality, who I was, without doing anything, you know, just me turning up as a child, wasn't really wanted, it wasn't desired. There was another type of person desired for, that was maybe easier, less difficult, (laughs) that kind of thing. And so um, I worked through quite a lot of layers of trying to unpick that and figure out what that meant. And that became clearer and clearer. And then once that had been healed, like as so many other things, but this is just so, it was, it's been the most kind of, and I'm sure it won't continue in this way, everything's sort of organic and all over the place, but it was quite linear in its kind of progression and in the healing progression. And the second one that came to you really strongly when I kind of healed that initial top layer, right underneath was something much deeper, right underneath. And it was the, the, the sense of being forsaken, like on a really deep, um, out of this world <laughs> kind of way. Um, essentially, the only wording I had at the time was sort of feeling like I was forsaken by God, but I didn't believe in God in the ways that many religions um, talk to God. Um, I just knew there was something greater and eventually I kind of replaced that with source. And so it was literally, it was feeling as if I didn't belong here and I'd been forgotten about, forsaken. I mean, that is, I can speak to it quite neutrally now because I've healed it. 
But at the time, it was really visceral, really deep. There was so much grief. I mean, so much grief around that. It almost felt like the original wound. But then <laughs> more of the things that I've unfolding, it's almost like a flower in some senses. Like you start to heal different layers of it. And sometimes I think you go back and forth. I've started to learn that it's not always deeper, deeper, deeper. Sometimes there's, you might sort of go back to a kind of what feels like a slightly... Hmm. Um, not quite as deep still needs healing still part of the journey but you might almost feel like you're going a layer back up to heal some more there (laughs) before you go on to the depths a little bit more and I started to go back to what I felt was a bit more you know it was still very painful but relative to the feeling forsaken forgotten about um it it didn't it felt lighter you know it was it was different wounds around feeling rejected as a teenager um, not feeling like I was, and particularly in relation to the HSP stuff, that I was kind of made wrong, you know, like I was different to other people. I didn't know anyone else that was HSP. I still to this day don't know if any of my family members are, <laughs> which is bizarre because it's meant to be an inherited trait. Um, and so I felt like in some way I was kind of wrong or a little bit defective. Um and so the rejection wound, even though it's a lighter, still painful, obviously, it that was part of the journey to kind of heal some more of that so that there was the ability for me to, um, at what, maybe six months later, it took a little while of healing other things, to reach a really deep wound, which was the kind of fourth stage, if you like, um, of this particular lack of belonging, which was hopelessness. Um, I had a real deep-seated belief that things were hopeless, that I couldn't overcome certain things, that I that it was pointless, that it didn't matter what I did or didn't do, or there was or there would always be a struggle, and um, and that actually that what's I, I mean literally was what's the point in living, even though it didn't manifest in my life as feeling suicidal in any way at a very deep level it was like this little seed if you like of just Mm. what's the point in this what is this all about what is the point and you know it did manifest in a few ways which I identified healing this which is wounded feminine predominantly it was also you know that was victim consciousness powerlessness huge programs for me within that hopelessness package and in feeling kind of a a lack of belonging it was specifically hopeless because I would never belong it was specifically linked to that it didn't matter how much I tried it wasn't possible to fit anywhere um and feel comfortable either and safe so I they manifest in that way and also in some of the kind of um, wounded masculine in like shutdown withdrawal you know internal bullying um, so it, there were lots of layers, but very distinct kind of um, levels, if you like, that I worked through to get, you know, and it may not even be the entirety of the whole thing, but it certainly shifted in such a way that obviously now things have changed. So that was just in terms of kind of speaking to the layers, that's that. But it really helped me under- identify how um, how large some of these wounds are and especially ones where they're linked to like the you know the really challenging stuff like shame this is pretty much a shame wound it's just um manifesting in terms of lack of belonging so it was yeah they're the biggies super powerful um i can relate to every single word that you have just spoken of Uh, For me, definitely is I always felt really unwanted as a kid. I remember I used to write in birthday cards to my mom. um, I wish that you didn't get to have a daughter like me or I wish that I came out better. I wish, you know, you got a better choice. And it was because of this wound of like, I just felt like, well, if you don't want me and I was already feeling like the world didn't want me. So then the sense of belonging was existed nowhere. And Mm -hmm. I, too, also. I struggle definitely. And it's a wound that I have to go into a lot of hopelessness as of, well, what's the point of any of this then? 
Mm-hmm. And if I'm never going to fit in, because what I had to do was, well, I'm too sensitive. I'm too emotional. I'm too this. I'm too that. That's not allowed. So how do I mm-hmm. survive? You know, I used to have this quote of like Darwinism of like survival of the, the the strongest and the fittest. And that's why I was like, OK, so I have to mask and suppress everything. And it mm-hmm. wasn't until I started doing this work where I was like, oh, so that's 33 years of me <laughs> suppressing that and then having it all come out is can be it, it's a lot it's a lot especially mm-hmm. for us HSPs mm-hmm. it is. <clears throat> yeah and for me the the unwanted thing I've really felt um mm-hmm. my 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 mom really wanted kids uh and my dad wanted kids too but I could mm-hmm. tell not as much as my mom and mm-hmm. so as as I grew up and grew older like I could definitely feel that energy as a HSP. Like I remember back to like being a child and I, I, I can still remember like feeling that um, just what, what was underlying. I could feel what the dynamic in their relationship for sure. Uh, and that was really interesting. And it, it definitely planted this seed you speak of. Um, mm-hmm. And then now like the, the hopelessness, the like, what is this? What's the point? That's something mm-hmm. I always come back to. And we were actually just talking mm-hmm. about it the other day. It's mm-hmm. something, it was like, it was put in there, I think as a child. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've always felt because of how emotional I was as a kid, because of how in tune with my heart and in tune with my emotions and how sensitive I was, sensitive I was. I always felt like I was completely different to everyone else, especially the men. Like I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't connect to men because the level in which I wanted to connect was so much deeper than the way that everyone else would connect. Uh, especially the more I matured when I was a kid, maybe not so much. Um, but the more I matured and, and was stepping into my role as an adult, I was like, always wanting to go deeper. And then during those years, I was finding myself gravitating more towards women. And now that I can see like that whole preference came from this fact that men are really taught to close, um, Mm -hmm. close, close their hearts, close off their emotion. Uh, And I was never taught that as a child. My dad didn't role model that behavior. Uh, Mm -hmm. He role modeled like being more in your emotions and sensitive. And so that's what I took forward. But then it was like I was a fish out of water because no one else was doing that. And Mm -hmm. so where do I fit in? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then that led to this this wound you speak of as, yeah, I don't belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because we've all had a similar wound and yet it's come about in different ways. You know, it's you can have that link. And that's why I think so many people will identify with this particular one. But how it comes about, how it looks, it really varies. And it's such a tailored process. That's why this works so great, because you get to um, not only, only understand the layers in the programs, but the nuances of what's in there. Not always. You know, sometimes there's things that I hear and I think, I have no idea what that's. I don't have an answer or why, you know. <laughs> But there are many occasions where it's very clear and it helps me see them when they're otherwise in my blind spot. So we all kind of arrive, not all, but many of us arrive at a similar kind of wounding, but just different paths, different things, you know, leading up to to that being the case. It's just, it's so interesting. It's always fascinating to me. I just love, I love humans. (laughs) We're just so intricate and complex. It's wonderful. Um, And yeah, it's, it's been a ride. It really has. I mean, this last one was, whew, that was, it was a real sucker punch. <laughs> one. Um, and I worked through quite a lot because, you know, there were points in teenage years where that was particularly cemented in for me. And um, just because I had a quite a severe experience of bullying for a few years. And um, I think where these programs have their root, their creation point in our childhood there's also things that happen in our life that might really just cement those babies right in. You know, it's just um, it, it, some, I think, can grow in strength because of the subsequent experience you have, whether you attract them in or not, you know, and um, whether it's just soul contracts you have with people before you come into this life. It's, you know, however it comes about, I, I really think there is a um, that there often is life experiences that just strengthen some of those wounds, you know, really put some, a little bit more pain into the pot of them. <laughs> so that was definitely my experience with some of the hopelessness stuff coming through and healing some of that. But now I have just, I think I liked it. I'm seeking to it now specifically rather than, you know, 
two layers ago, for instance, and that was really significant for me, even that, just because it's kind of got to the point, I think intuitively, and you obviously grow your intuitive powers with this work and understand more about yourself and things that inner knowings, you know, that you, you can't really explain it aren't necessarily logical, but I have a sense now that a huge bulk of this is healed. Like it really, I've seen it manifest in my life in the sense that I don't have to try anymore and I make so much space for other people and myself and my self-care and rest and things that I need as HSP as well. I've just got like more of a vibrancy about me. You know, I've got more stamina in social situations. I'm not analysing my every move in social situations. I have found I'm attracting in more people that I would... um, I would name as like soul family members rather than just great people who are also wonderful. Mm-hmm. They actually, there's definitely a sense that all there's something very strong in terms of connection with some of the people that have come in just all of a sudden since literally healing the hopelessness wound mm-hmm. attached to the lack of belonging. And just a sense that I, I'm just a bit more confident. And I, I sort of slightly resist using that word because confidence is so, you know, it's be more confident but for me it's it, it's I feel like I my something's heavy has literally left like my solar plexus and I mean you know me before this work I was not talking about chakras or energy <laughs> healing or like I, it, it was all new and yet I it couldn't be more real now mm. you know this just sense that there's a weight lifted that that here is a space and this space manifests outwardly um, to allow more people in, to uh, allow myself to belong somewhere, to feel a sense of connection at that deeper level. So it's really been quite tangible in a, a, a real shift um, that I can see in my life. It's just wonderful. It's just a step on from even where I was before. So um, yeah, it just has such wonderful benefits and they don't all work like that. You don't heal something and then suddenly it shows up in your life and you see like, oh, that is definitely related to that Mm. it doesn't all work like that but there are certain ones where I think for me I've noticed big shifts after healing particular ones at a particular point so fascinating (laughs) there was a a really interesting book that I read a few years ago now called tribe it's by Sebastian Mm. Junger um, and he talks about how it's all about the sense of belonging and he talks about Mm. how um, people, when they're in tribes, they feel this this sense of belonging. They feel part of something. And that actually, um, during the war, right, we had the Blitz in, in the UK, which is when Germany was bombing the hell out of uh, out of London. And during those times, everyone was retreating from their, their houses, taking refuge in, um, in the underground subway system. And uh, this period was very extreme, very hard for everyone. But one thing a, a scientist was studying the psychology of everyone. One thing they noticed is that doctors, um, people that worked in the corner shop, you know, everyone became the same level and they had this common interest of just survival and it brought everyone together. And, and in his book, he outlines that everyone is actually looking for this sense of belonging and that when the blitz was over, they actually missed that time. And they were actually looked back on it as this time of, um, that of enjoyment because there was a deep, deep part of them that was really, really being fulfilled. But what I've come to learn is that deep part of ourselves, we're never going to get it truly from an external place of like going through a hard, like going through hardship does bring people together for sure. But do you really want to live your life relying on hardship to feel Mm. like you belong? I personally don't. So it sounds like what you're talking to is a way for you to find belonging just by going through your healing journey, by finding the parts of you that were making you feel isolated. And Mm -hmm. then the more that you're connecting, it's one of the ways of oneness, right? The way of connection, the Mm -hmm. more that you're becoming the way of connection, connecting to your higher self, your soul, that is allowing you and all those things that you mentioned are blocking that connection, right? It's yeah. allowing you to feel this connection and feeling like you actually belong and that you have a place in this world. 
Indeed, yeah, it absolutely. And that's what I mean in terms of speaking to the spaciousness that is created, because it has created space for things to come in, like some of the qualities of the way of connection. And um, and even, to be honest, the way of responsibility has taken a bit of a role in this as well, because it's my responsibility to heal this stuff, to have the courage to go into it. And some of it's awful. <laughs> you know, it's not fun to heal some of this stuff. <laughs> And um, so actually just having the courage and taking that responsibility was, has also been a feature as well as, um, and I'm still working with it a great deal, but also the way of patience, you know, being patient with this, this stuff I've been healing now for, which some would consider quick, but, but at least 18, no, not quite 18 months. So, you know, it's not like it's overnight and I feel that this is actually been fairly swift but even just having the patience to stick with it to be start um connecting with any of the signs any of the things that come through just i i agree in terms of the book reference and just speaking to us needing to connect with our hearts to have the courage to keep going back to keep being with the inner child to keep validating them to keep encouraging them to grow through to maturate emotionally so so important to just keep building the stamina for it and building that heart connection, that self-connection. And yes, we have had, sadly, another sort of, you know, not dissimilar example of tragedy and survival in obviously different, but the pandemic being a recent example of, of that. And yet um, I think it's, it hasn't necessarily brought out the way of connection. If anything, you know, a lot of the science shows that that there's a, a lowered amount of empathy globally now and um so I think it's even more important to not rely on anything else on this you know um on this sense that when the chips are down everyone's connected and supporting each other and because you're then waiting for more suffering for that to happen when you've actually got the power already within you that you just really need to reclaim as part of the healing work to heal this stuff, to end your suffering. Yes, it's not an overnight process, but it's very possible. And on the journey, you grow in such strength. Um, And that's the truest thing I've ever come across. It's, um, it's, yeah, it it really does work. I'd love to talk about victim consciousness a little bit um, Mm -hmm. deeper because Um, And this is, I always have to preface this, this is me not shaming my mother, but I think that because I I truly believe my mother is a worker of the light and she came here on a mission and I think a lot of things in life got the best of her and Mm -hmm. I witnessed my whole life of her being the victim, right? And I think because I was already dealing with this loss of belonging anywhere and feeling like, you know, I wasn't like anybody else, I would fall into victim a lot. And Mm -hmm. even sometimes on my healing journey, when I get too overwhelmed with how much is in me and how much of the unhealed stuff comes up, Mm -hmm. I resort sometimes to the victim consciousness because it's easier for me to be in that space than to actually run into everything that's really showing itself. And so I think a lot of people out there, especially women, um, we go into that space a lot of being the victim. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more, Emily, of how that showed up for you in your life and then how you really overcame it. Yeah. Okay. So, so victim consciousness for me, um, predominantly, showed itself as um it had a crossover with um wounded masculine so so my symptoms my byproduct of um being in powerlessness and victim consciousness was withdrawal shutdown keeping people out that kind of thing which is more the masculine but the um the victim consciousness specifically for me is more wounded feminine you know the internalized wounded feminine I never got to kind of, as far as I'm aware, toxic feminine in terms of putting that back out to the world and other people. It was very much um, uh, in some ways it, it manifested in terms of being the victim as keeping the cycles of thoughts going around I'll never be one of them or I'll never be accepted or I'll always be on the periphery. Um, it was 
very much keeping myself locked in those cycles of thought. So um, that was a big pattern with within the victim consciousness cycle because I wasn't even in a place where I was verbalizing it. And often when we're in victim consciousness, we're speaking to it a lot. It might manifest in, you know, regularly complaining to partners or, um, you know, not being able to not speak to that story. Whereas I was very tight-lipped about most of it. Um, Honestly, I didn't really share any uh, why was me stories. And yet, um, and yet I was telling myself them. I was, and it was showing up as me blocking myself energetically as well as physically from anyone else. I mean, you know, I, I, I barely had any friends. I could probably, I think that, well, honestly, there's probably about three people that I could call a friend for all of my 20s and yeah, uh, up until 30 years old. It was really, um, it was, I had a very small, small world, which was mostly resulting from the fact that I was playing the victim. I'm never going to be safe. I'm not going to be able to trust people. Um, poor me. You know, it was, um, and, and being stuck in that cycle was very real. And it's very, it can reinforce fear, hesitation, inauthenticity. Um, and it's just a vicious loop. It was a hamster wheel I just, I needed to get off of and I was ready to heal that in particular. So that's really how it showed up for me um, that I'm aware of. Maybe there are other things in my blind spot where it, it manifested, but for the most part, it was it was really in cycles of thoughts and isolation essentially from others. Mm. Mm. Um, as you're speaking, what comes up for me is um, I've recently learned that I have a very closed heart and mm. I think that it's been closed because it's not been ever safe for me and nobody understood me my whole life. And so the way that I reacted to all of that and to survive was literally to shut myself down. So even when like I stopped sharing stories about me, I stopped sharing how emotional I was or the things that I was going through. And I started seeing like, even in my career as an interviewer, I was always making it about someone else because in my mind, I've already programmed and conditioned myself to um, think and believe that, well, whatever I feel, it's too much for the world and nobody wants to hear it. So just, just, just put that away, just put that away. And that definitely has kept me, um, in, in a state of smallness and weakness and not Mm -hmm. letting myself really be heard and be seen and be felt as, you know, the beautiful layered being that I am. And, um, I think there has been a lot of times where I'm seeking somebody to feel bad for me, and not me actually seeing what the wounding is behind all of it. And so hearing you say that, first of all, like, you know, there, I relate to you so much Em, in so many ways. And, um, this is really that chapter in of our, of our lives where as we accept ourselves, everything will, you know, become abundant and flourish in so many ways. And it really mm-hmm. takes warriors work to even face that part of you, to even say those words, to speak them. And the more that we speak it, the more that we stand taller. And so I, Thank you for sharing that because it's just so relatable to me. Yeah, and and uh, and it is. I think it's it's it is something that a lot of people relate to. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's uncommon. I don't think we're alone. Mm-hmm. And and even something that came to me when you were speaking to that was also just this. Um, the victim, in many ways, is is also linked for me to the self judge, the self critic, which I know is strong in all of us. <laughs> Um, I've not met a person yet that hasn't got a strong self-critic, you know, even even if the criticism isn't as loud as others. Um, it, I think a part and parcel of some of this is, is also trying to heal the self-judgment, which in some cases can manifest as outward judgment as well, which is obviously the more toxic side. But but the inner wounding often internalized is just it's just like this inner judge with a massive stick that keeps whacking you over the head the whole time. <laughs> Um, so even just healing part of that, which I think shows up a bit in powerlessness in the victim consciousness we were speaking to, is um, that in itself is huge. Just even be able to lessen that voice, or you know, give compassion to that voice, in, in order for those wounds to start up leveling, becoming more neutral, losing their power, and in 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 its place, you reclaiming more of your own that's already there. 
Emily, I'd love you, for you to go into um, the forsaken, the rejection, the second layer, because uh, mm -hmm. that's something that um, I'm not too familiar with. So, yeah, enlighten us. Mm. Mm. Yeah, neither was I. All of this is quite a shock when it comes around, you know, <laughs> it's like unexpected. So this one was a bit uh, sort of, um, oh, what's the word? It was, it's probably a bit more unusual. Um, and this one was linked to some soul wounding as well. Um, so I, which Rachel helped guide me through because I didn't, I didn't know. So she was able to say, well, this is what it is. This is what's coming through to me in terms of guidance. So when this was coming up, this was in, um, when I was still working through the, um, the coaching course with Rachel, um, probably halfway through ish. And, at the time, I wasn't getting a lot of information in terms of what I could see because most of my healings have been very visual. I get a lot of visuals. Um, sometimes I'm taken to places um, or I get symbols and signs that I can usually have an inner knowing about that help to like piece the things together. With this one, it was very, it was a lot of darkness there wasn't a lot of information and it was quite representative as it turns out of, of nothingness of just being left of feeling like I'd been forgotten. Like I'd just been dumped here and get on with it. And there's no one coming to get you to help to keep their promise is what kept coming through. So I had a real sense that like creator source, God, whatever name, had just forsaken me it, it, it was just like I how could I possibly have chosen this is obviously as a child this is me very early on I believe this one was about 18 months old and then there were other later um in the children that needed healing around this one but this one was was um I could only verbalize it now but obviously back then it was just all feeling it was just all feeling that now I was being able to put words to and the feeling was in adult words, <laughs> was like, oh, no one's coming for me. Like, what is, this could be basically the equivalent of like hell on earth. Like this is, and the loneliness that came with that was huge, huge. Um, and I, even though I've healed a lot of that, even remembering how sad that was, still make, I can still feel a lot of compassion for me. How, I mean, just in grief total grief and loneliness um, and the hurt that came with that. So it was a really, um, it was a very uh, simple and yet very deep wound to work through in that regard. And it was as simple as that. It was, it was being forsaken in that sense, but um, I, I needed to spend a lot of time with my inner children to heal those, that particular one. And there were several inner children to be with um, and and I had to bring a lot of love you know we bring different threads of love um to that one fortunately I felt very compassionate towards those inner children for obvious reasons um and so it wasn't hard to do that but I had to keep going back because that one ran deep it really did what uh what ages showed up for you in terms of your inner child was it um was it like you know, a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old? And did you have to heal them uh, like reverse chronological order? Yeah, great question. Because uh, it's honestly been different with every wound. Um, uh, it, for me, I am, you know, Rachel's teachings suggest that obviously the, the younger you can go, the, the better in terms of if you can heal as close to or the point of creation, then all the other children will be impacted positively because obviously you're getting the very root, essentially, is the way I understand it. So I started to heal um, the 18-month-year-old who was the, the furthest back I ever went with this particular wound. And then um, other uh, and the forsaken wound in particular. And there was also a three-year-old and a five-year-old with this one. And then the others were all different ages. So all the others that came with this kind of lack of belonging wound that, you know, they all packaged together, the four that I've spoken to, um, the all different ages, many teenage years as well um, with, with them, where certain points of creation 
wound was created and then really kind of cemented in, uh, really locked in in teenage years as well. So it's been a mix, but this particular one, it was 18 months, um, three and five. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Um, you know, it, it's so crazy because when you're little, you think you're the only person in the world that has these feelings or emotions, right? And I, re- I really remember just always looking around and observing people and then observing earth. And, and always this question would come up as what, what, what is this truly, what is this place? Mm-hmm. What is this place? Why does it feel like the way that it does? Why do I feel so much sadness here? It's not like my life was like extremely sad. So then what is this feeling that was deep inside of me? And it was a lot of crying. I just remember a lot of sleepless nights as a child. And then Mm -hmm. going to my parents and being like, do you feel this way? And do you look outside? And do you think the same ways that I think? And they would always chalk it up to be like, okay, you're being dramatic or you're too this or you're too that. And then I would gaslight myself to be like, well, something's wrong with you. So you need to fix that or you need to hide it because you got a whole life to do. And now I know in my journey, it was, oh, the moment that I was disconnected from source and I came into this physical body, into this physical existence, I came into the world with not the knowing like you of like, I was forsaken, but I knew that I was dropped off here and nobody told me the directions of what any of this was or what any of this is. And like, now I knew that I had to go through my whole life to have my awakening, to understand deeply what it was all about Mm -hmm. for me to really start healing and accepting and honoring. And now I'm at this place where I'm so grateful of the fact that I didn't fit in the whole time, you know, Mm -hmm. of the fact that all of those experiences led me to this place of really stepping into this, to this position of I'm here. I was always different. And that Mm -hmm. is my power. And so now that I am different and now that I feel all the things that I do feel, how can I show up for myself and then the world uh, collectively in all of that? Yeah. Did you have any resentment towards God or the universe or was there any resentment that built around? Yeah. A lot of resentment, a lot of anger, a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, and Danny, I'm sure a lot of us, you know, on this path can relate. There have been some really dark times where what is the point of this life and this existence? And Mm -hmm. could I just pull the plug and then that'd be cool. And then I'd be away Mm -hmm. from this all the time because that would be better in, in my darkness. That's better than me actually undergoing this whole life and this experience. But I think now that's really transmuted into, no, that's all a part of what I'm here to do. It fuels you. Yeah. It so does. And just having that gratitude at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I feel I totally resonate in terms of the appreciation for those things, obviously, out, not out the other end of it, but on the side where I know I at least know what some of it was even about. You know, I know that there was some initiations involved and that that we are to, to a large degree, certain soul contracts and things come into our life where we chose it when we were a neutral soul. It's only on earth that we make these interpretations of good or bad and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but absolutely, you've got to take some time to be appreciative of some of the things that are going on here because it's so huge and it's such a weight lifted. But to your point about like, you don't even need to have, essentially I heard is that you don't even need to have like a, a sad childhood or be, or, you know, have parents that are awful. Mine certainly weren't. They really did do genuinely without our, it remotely bypassing, they really did do the best they could. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, we didn't have loads of struggles in, in, in terms of kind of some of the big T trauma stuff. Mm-hmm. But even still, you know, just even having the backdrop of being highly sensitive, just even having the, the ability to, uh, I'm quite etheric, I didn't realise this, obviously, but I'm much more so than grounded and anchored to the earth. Who knew? So um, Mm -hmm. because of that, I was totally disorientated all the time. And my parents didn't know how to handle it. You know, I I cried all the time. I was I was labeled a difficult child because I was relative to my brother and sister. And, you know, I I was more to handle. I was a very bold child. Fortunately, some of that came through in terms of, you know, saying what I mean. But but uh, I went through a process of really feeling quite squashed and it wasn't anyone's fault. It was just, I came in a little different from everyone else. It wasn't, you know, people don't have parenting courses and they don't have that kind of knowledge and understanding. I wish they would and I would, you know, 
MSU offers it. So anyone that wants to sign up some parenting stuff, please get in the queue because it's just, it's so needed in the world. Um, but just, yeah, I just wanted to speak to that bit too, because that is an important piece. There is no blame or judgment at all. And it really is this self-responsibility piece I spoke to earlier about what's my stuff, what have I come in here to do? And um, can I get aligned with what my soul's come here to do mm-hmm. so that everything's flowing a little bit more, even if it is tough, so I don't have to suffer so more. And that's my responsibility. And it's how do I take my life forward and what can I appreciate without bypassing, of course, um, and and what new levels of joy can I access? So it's yeah. that, that piece is huge, I think, in all of this too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Danny, I'd love to ask, because, you know, me and Emily have, a lot of it similar experiences, but your path to belonging had to do with being so sensitive and being different mm-hmm. from other men. So could you kind of talk? Cause I feel like you're really finding that space for you right now. Yeah. I mean, when I was a child, I remember having this, um, this thought come into my awareness that my role really here on earth is to spread love. And I remember looking around and seeing how disconnected, especially men were I was I, as a kid I was all always wanting a, a, a girlfriend always always wanted a girlfriend and this was before my parents even split so this wasn't like an abandonment wound that I was mm-hmm. trying to fill I remember like being a real I always wanted I always wanted a girlfriend because I felt like I just had so much love to give mm-hmm. and I remember like growing up and seeing just the lack of love in society that people will give each other and obviously like I accumulated a lot of programs and wounds which led me on that path too and I'm still working on those I'm still healing them but I still remember this this moment in my bedroom and I remember it like it hit me and I was like I am here really to spread the love and to open people up to to love too Mm -hmm. Uh, and so growing up with this philosophy this like deep knowing in my mind of that is what I came here to do and then seeing what society was and the way especially men were showing up it was like oh I'm very different not everyone feels like this. I this this is my kind of purpose, and this isn't what everyone else is doing. So just that alone, that for me was very isolating. Um, and the whole like side of belonging, I just it it didn't feel like my mission was in alignment with what I was seeing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that I wasn't seeing love and I was brought up around a lot of love. It was just kind of like I had this a- ability to see deeper into and feel because I could feel so much as a child. Um, mm-hmm. I remember just like feeling different people's energies and I can put word on it now and I couldn't then. Mm-hmm. And I would be like, oh yeah, there's there's no love there. And now it's I'm hyper aware, especially because I've healed a lot of my codependence and attachment. Now, sure, there's probably still a little bit left in there that I'm still working on. But once you go through something like that, you're able to really detect it very acutely in another person. And when you see a relationship dynamic playing out, if I can be that, I can really feel what's going on because I've healed some of those things in me. Um, But to get back to like the, that isolated part. Yeah. It's just been, for me, it's been this journey of knowing that I'm here to do this deeper work, knowing that I'm here to do something with love and then seeing an, uh, an absence of it, especially in men, but in society as a whole. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 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 You know, man, I, I, um, Emily, I think a lot of people are going to really relate to this in very deep ways. Mm-hmm. And I always love to ask the question of a first listener of, you know, they'll listen to this and they'll be like, wow, those three really did it and they're really doing it. How do I start? And so how did you, if you, any last words for somebody out there who really wants to begin the path to belonging of finding that within themselves, uh, any uh, words of wisdom? Yeah, thank you. Um, At the risk of sounding the same as everyone else, you've got to start somewhere. (laughs) I mean, it really is true. It, you know, it's challenging. It really is to figure out where to start, who to start with. There's a lot of offerings out there. And yet, speaking from my own experience of MSU, I've always had a good radar for hearing healing in people's voices. I can hear how healed they are. And Rachel 
is healed. <laughs> you know, she's not perfect because she's also human. Mm -hmm. You know, we all are. There is no perfection in that in that sense. But this is the most whole person I've ever encountered in my life. And I've been to so many gurus and teachers and mentors and wonderful people. But there is something different in how she teaches, what she's teaching, where she's getting it from, uh, in terms of, you know, being able to tap into um, higher teachings. And everything I've learned through Rachel and everything I've applied myself and teach my clients and coach my clients through, are uh, it, it really is different. It is original. I know I've spoken to that before, but I need to reiterate, like it's, I, I've never found anything quite like this. And so if you're going to start with anything, start with something that isn't being widely taught, because if you're actually starting to think about what might really work, the tried and tested stuff that if it had worked already, people wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be needing to return, would need to be going back. And with MSU, there isn't a need to keep going back. It's the work is original and it's of the highest source I've ever come across. And you're also empowered. You can take it forward on your own. You know, MSU are not your crutch. There's lots of advanced classes and teachings you can seek out here. But if even you did the basic stuff, just the three month course, you'd be set for life. You know, th there is so much continued healing you can do yourself without relying on others. That empowerment piece for me has always stuck out hugely from everything else. So that would probably be my final word on that. I just check us out and see, you know, feel into it if you're that way inclined. Just have a feel for whether or not um, this feels resonant for you, that it feels truthful. I'm always encouraging of people to be curious and a little cautious. I think there's no problem with that, you know, when checking things out. So go to the site, have a really good look and a rummage around and and speak to one of us. You know, it's it's free if you're serious about um about the work and doing the work and you feel like this could be for you, then free consultation, you know, grab your opportunity. Um you really, really won't regret it. It's it really it, it really is life changing. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you all want to set up a free consultation with Emily, Danny, or me, check us out at mastersofselfuniversity.com. Emily, we love you so much. Always uh, such a pleasure to have you on. You want to wrap us up? Okay. Yeah, please like, subscribe, share. <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, send it to like your best mate. Yeah. Wh whatever it is that you're feeling called to do, if you really enjoyed it, it helps us out so much. So thank you so much for making it to the end if you're listening right now, and we'll we'll hear from you soon.